Hello, everybody. I welcome you to this uh, webinar organized by the KDGO staff. Uh, the title of the webinar is Optimal Anemia Management in CKD, a new paradigm in treatment. I am Tilman Drücke, uh, the moderator from INSERM Hospital Paul Bruce in Paris, France. The two speakers are Jody Babbitt from Mass General Hospital and uh, Francesco Locatelli from Ospedale Alessandro Manzoni in Italy. Anemia is a major complication of CKD. It reduces the quality of life both from a physical and a mental point of view. The introduction of erythropoietin in the 1980s was a major breakthrough in its treatment and greatly improved patient well-being. However, it became clear subsequently that full anemia correction could do more harm than benefit. Therefore, only partial anemia correction became standard of care. At that time, nephrologists also became aware that many patients had iron deficiency and that its correction could be beneficial. However, still many questions remain open as regards the diagnosis and optimal treatment approaches of iron deficiency. Moreover, a new class of anemia correcting agents has been developed, namely the HIF stabilizers, also called prolyl hydroxylase domain inhibitors. One of them has already found its way into the clinical arena in some countries. These exciting new developments led to the organization by KDGO of an international controversies conference in Barcelona in December, 2019. Now, the first speaker, Jody Babbitt, will uh, deal with ironing out anemia management in CKD. Dr. Babbitt is currently an associate professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and the director of translational research in the nephrology division at Mass General Hospital. Her lab research is focused on understanding the mechanisms regulating systemic iron homeostasis and developing new diagnostic and therapeutic strategies for treating disorders of iron, iron imbalance. She has made several landmark discoveries including the key role for the bone morphogenic protein, BMP, signaling pathway in governing the expression of hepcidin to control systemic iron homeostasis. She has over 60 publications in this area. Dr. Locatelli, the next speaker, the second speaker, is past director of the Department of Nephrology and Dialysis at Alessandro Manzoni Hospital in Lecco, Italy. He is past president of several renal associations, including ERA, ERA EDTA, International Society of Blood Purification, International Society of Geriatric Nephrology, and Italian Society of Nephrology. His research interest as a clinical nephrologist is focused on the anemia of CKD and in addition to many other aspects of the pathophysiology and treatment of patients with CKD. He has published more than 600 peer-reviewed articles in different fields of nephrology. So now we will start with the presentation by Dr. Babbitt entitled Ironing Out Anemia Management in CKD. Jody, please. Thank you, Tillman, for that kind introduction. It's my pleasure to talk to you today about ironing out anemia management in CKD. My disclosures are shown here. So it seems in this recent data from CK DAPS, anemia remains quite prevalent in CKD patients worldwide, with increasing prevalence as kidney disease progresses, becoming almost universal at the most advanced stages. The etiology of anemia is multifactorial, involving two important components of red blood cell production. One is the hormone erythropoietin that's made by the kidney and acts on the bone marrow to stimulate the proliferation and maturation of red cells. The second is iron, which is an essential component of hemoglobin that allows the red cells to carry oxygen. Iron is provided by absorption from the diet, as well as recycling from the senescent red cells. When they get old, they get taken up by macrophages, which can store the iron and release it back into circulation as needed. The supply of iron is controlled by the iron regulatory hormone hepcidin that's made by the liver and is excreted by the kidney. 
The function of pepsidin is to bind and induce the degradation of the iron transport protein ferroportin, which controls iron entry into the circulation of both from dietary sources and macrophage stores. Kidney disease patients have disturbances in both of these pathways. Reduced functioning nephron mass leads to the decrease in erythropoietin production. Uh, uremia also uh, causes the inhibition of the actions of erythropoietin on the bone marrow. CKD patients also have shortened red cell survival, as well as increased blood loss due to increased bleeding tendency, uh, frequent phlebotomy, as well as blood trapping in the dialyzer tubing. This leads to anemia directly, as well as indirectly by reducing the amount of iron that's available for recycling. CKD patients also have excess levels of the iron hormone hepcidin, both as a consequence of increased production induced by inflammation, as well as reduced clearance by the kidney. This leads to an impairment of the absorption of iron from the diet and the release of iron from stores. The combination of these factors leads to two types of iron deficiency in CKD patients. One is an absolute iron deficiency where there's a deficiency of both circulating iron and stored iron measured respectively by transferrin saturation and ferritin. The second form is a functional iron deficiency where there's a deficiency of circulating iron available for erythropoiesis, despite the fact that the stores of iron in the body may be normal or even high. Uh, and this is caused by excess levels of the iron regulatory hormone hepcidin. Therefore, the mainstay of anemia management is really to uh, uh, supplement erythropoietin through erythropoiesis stimulating agents, which we'll hear more about in the second talk, as well as iron supplementation, which will be the focus of my talk. Now, when thinking about iron, it's important to keep in mind that its, extent, its function actually extends beyond red cell production. Heme itself, as well as other iron functional groups, such as iron sulfur clusters, are important components of a number of other enzymes that perform fundamental cellular processes in everything from the TCA cycle to electron transport uh, to DNA synthesis and more. And therefore the, the functional consequences of iron deficiency may extend beyond anemia, leading to such things as cardiovascular strain, impaired muscle function, impaired exercise tolerance, work performance, altered immune function, and in, in kids, developmental defects, growth retardation, and neurologic defects. The property of iron that makes it important for these biologic functions is its property as a transition metal, being able to readily donate and accept electrons. This means that iron can also participate in this so-called Fenton-mediated reaction um, that can lead to the generation of free oxygen radicals. And when in excess, this can be damaging to cells and tissues just as all cells in our body need iron to grow and proliferate, so do infectious organisms. And therefore excess iron can also be associated with the increased risk of certain types of infections. The most clear clinical manifestations of the, the um, toxicities related to excess iron are seen in the genetic iron overload disorders, hereditary hemochromatosis, and iron loading anemia such as thalassemia, where excess iron depositing in organs such as the liver, heart, and endocrine glands lead to organ dysfunction. Um, therefore, iron is essential, but too much iron is toxic. The question then remains about what is the impact of altered iron homeostasis and anemia in CKD patients. There are numerous observational studies that have reported an association of anemia and altered iron status with adverse outcomes in CKD patients. This is one recent example of a retrospective study in over 900,000 patients with non-dialysis CKD from the US Veterans Association. And in this study, they found that CKD patients with anemia had a higher risk of all-cause mortality uh, with a hazard ratio of 1.58. Additionally, uh, the subgroup of patients with functional iron deficiency anemia, as well as patients with elevated ferritin levels also had an increased risk of mortality. And this persisted even after adjusting for potential confounders. In this study, both absolute iron deficiency anemia and functional iron deficiency anemia were also associated with an increased risk of one in two year cardiovascular hospitalization. Now, association does not prove causation. Um, and importantly, we need to understand better how iron supplementation strategies impact hard patient outcomes. 
Additionally, we need to understand what are the optimal treatment targets and dosing strategies. For this, we need high quality randomized controlled trial data. Importantly, we now do have RCT data in this space, uh, the most important of which is the pivotal trial. This was a prospective randomized control trial in over 2000 incident hemodialysis patients that compared a proactive strategy of IV iron in the formulation of iron sucrose that was dosed at 400 milligrams per month. And this was given every month and only withheld if the TSAT was above 40% or the ferritin was above 700. This was compared to a reactive strategy of IV iron uh, in lesser doses that was only given if the TSAT fell below 20% or the ferritin fell below 200. This was a non-inferiority trial and the primary endpoints evaluated were the composite of non-fatal MI, stroke, heart failure, hospitalization, or death. Secondary endpoints included components of the primary endpoint, as well as ESA dose, transfusion, and infections. The median follow-up was 2.1 years. So what was seen in this study is that patients in the proactive arm uh, achieved median TSATs uh, in the mid 20% uh, compared with the reactive arm where many patients actually fell below the threshold of what is considered consistent with iron deficiency in this patient population, uh, that being a TSAT of 20%. Uh, ferritin levels uh, uh, were in the range of uh, 600 uh, in the proactive arm compared with many patients in the reactive arm who again fell below the threshold of what is considered consistent with uh, iron deficiency in this patient population, that being a ferritin less than 200. Looking at the primary outcomes, the proactive arm was non-inferior to the reactive arm. And because they met the non-inferiority uh, threshold, they were able to evaluate for superiority and in fact, the proactive arm did have improved outcomes compared to the reactive arm in the primary efficacy endpoints, the composite of non-fatal MI, stroke, heart failure, hospitalization, or death. Moreover, the proactive arm had less use of ESAs and fewer transfusions. Importantly, this occurred um, without increasing the risk of infection. So the implications of this trial are we now have good RCT data to tell us that we should avoid ferritins below 200 and TSATs below 20% in hemodialysis patients. We have evidence of that this causes harm. We also know that using regular IV iron, unless the ferritin is above 700 or the TSAT is above 40%, resulted in improved outcomes and was safe leaving open the possibility that perhaps this pivotal regimen might have been optimal, um, but it still remains unknown whether lower or intermediate dose or target strategies might have been sufficient. And moreover, it still remains unclear what the upper limit of TSAT and ferritin is in terms of safety, ESA dose reduction and patient outcomes. There is retrospective observational data out there that still does raise potential safety concerns of two intensive treatment strategies with IV iron. Uh, one such example is this study in CJSON, which was a retrospective study of over 13,000 hemodialysis patients that were assigned to one of five IV iron strategies. Strategy one was the reference strategy as shown here. And strategy five was the most aggressive strategy. And as you can see here, the strategy five was more aggressive than the proactive arm in the pivotal trial. And this study found an increased risk of all cause mortality, as well as infection related morbidity and mortality in the most aggressive arm. Therefore, caution is still warranted with IV iron strategies that are more intensive than the proactive arm of pivotal. And we still do need more randomized control trial data with hard outcomes to fully understand optimal treatment targets. What about the non-dialysis CKD population? We do not have a similar level of evidence in this population as we do in the hemodialysis population. Uh, what we do have is the fine CKD trial. This was a prospective randomized control trial of a higher dose of IV iron in the form of ferric carboxymaltose that was dosed to target ferritins of 400 to 600 compared with a lower dose arm of IV iron um, or oral iron in the form of ferrous sulfate that was dosed to target lower ferritins of 100 to 200. The primary outcomes in this trial were the need for additional anemia therapies 
or hemoglobin is falling below target. What they found in this study was the high dose IV iron arm did have improved outcomes compared with the oral iron arm um, in that primary outcome. There was no statistically significant difference reported between the high dose IV iron arm and the low dose IV iron arm, although you can see that the curves between those two groups were quite similar. Importantly, however, in this study, hard outcomes were not specifically assessed. Um, and so we still do need more um, uh, prospective randomized control trial data with hard outcomes in this patient population to help understand optimal uh, therapeutic uh, strategies. One other thing to point out from this trial is that although the high dose IV iron group did have a faster and higher rise in hemoglobin compared to the oral iron group, you can see that the oral iron group did in fact have improvements both in TSAT and hemoglobin levels uh, over the course of the study. And additionally, uh, um, it was uh, not inferior to the low dose IV iron group that was dosed to target similar ferritin levels. Uh, and so in my mind, uh, this data does suggest that there still is a place uh, for oral iron therapy uh, in uh, the non-dialysis CKD patient population. Now, given the importance of iron for biologic functions outside of red cell production, another important question is whether there might be a benefit to treating iron deficiency beyond anemia management. Much of the data in this realm comes from the heart failure literature. Uh, um, in particular, uh, I'm showing you here data um, from the FAIR HF trial. This was a prospective randomized control trial in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction who had iron deficiency. Patients were randomized to receive IV iron in the form of ferric carboxymaltose versus placebo. As you can see here, patients in the IV iron arm had better uh, self-reported global assessment as well as improvements in New York Heart Association functional class. This was not a CKD trial, but the subgroup of patients with CKD seemed to have similar benefits as those without. And intriguingly, uh, this benefit seemed to be uh, there regardless of whether or not the patients had anemia. In other words, similar benefits were seen in the subgroup of patients who had hemoglobins of above 12. Subsequent trials have uh, also confirmed similar data, uh, including looking at some more um, objective um, criteria. Uh, this is data here from the CONFIRM HF trial showing that IV iron uh, was also able to improve uh, the six minute walk test uh, in heart failure patients. And secondary analysis also showed uh, um, a delay in the time to first heart failure hospitalization. Reductions in, in heart failure hospitalizations have also been seen and confirmed in subsequent trials. Um, these data are consistent with a potential role for iron supplementation beyond anemia management that may be particularly important for heart failure patients. Um, but this does need to be studied more carefully in the CKD patient population. Considering additional impacts of treating iron deficiency beyond anemia management, there's also new recognition of links between iron, erythropoietin, inflammation, and FGF23. As you all know, FGF23 is a hormone that inhibits kidney phosphate reabsorption and 125 vitamin D production. It's increased in CKD where it contributes to bone and mineral disorders and is also associated with adverse cardiovascular outcomes and mortality. Interestingly, there's new data that has come out that has revealed that iron deficiency, inflammation, and erythropoietin all stimulate the production of FGF23. This raises the intriguing uh, hypothesis that these uh, might contribute to excess FGF23 levels in CKD patients and potentially uh, its associated adverse outcomes. And this also raises the intriguing corollary hypothesis that potentially a treatment of iron deficiency could help ameliorate FGF23 excess. These are areas of active investigation by many groups. Um, the connection between these uh, two pathways is also uh, particularly relevant to certain types of iron formulations, in particular ferric citrate, which has a dual role, both as an oral iron compound and a phosphate binder. Uh, additionally, there's been recognition recently that certain IV iron preparations, in particular ferric carboxymaltose, saccharated iron oxides, and iron polymaltose, can actually stimulate FGF23 production and cause hypophosphatemia. 
Now, what about the choice of iron formulation? Oral iron has been the mainstay of initial anemia management for iron deficiency in the non-dialysis CKD patient population. Oral iron agents have variable effectiveness for improving iron parameters in hemoglobin, reducing ESA use and transfusions. Uh, one challenge with these agents has been uh, poor GI tolerance, as well as the hepcidin-mediated block of dietary absorption, which can limit their effectiveness. And there uh, have been clinical trials that have demonstrated reduced effectiveness compared with uh, IV iron, particularly at more advanced stages of CKD. We do now have newer oral iron agents. Uh, particular agents of note include ferric citrate and liposomal iron, which may be better tolerated, allowing for higher doses of iron uh, or alternatively having uh, alternative mechanisms of absorption that can evade the hepcidin blockade, leading potentially to more effective uh, therapy, but more research is needed in this area. Um, there are some head-to-head um, -head trial data that is starting to come out. Uh, this is one uh, such study that was published recently. This is a small prospective RCT comparing ferric citrate to ferrous sulfate in iron deficient CKD patients over a period of 12 weeks. In this study, uh, they did find that ferric citrate was superior to ferrous sulfate as far as improving TSATs uh, and ferritin. Um, this also led to a, a small but significant increase in hemoglobin in the ferric citrate group uh, that was not seen in the ferrous sulfate group, although the differences between uh, the groups was not significant in this study. Uh, interestingly, uh, this improvement in iron in the ferric citrate group occurred despite the fact that hepcidin was increased more in the ferric citrate group. This was likely a consequence of the higher iron levels in this group, which is a, which is a stimulator of hepcidin production. One ex explanation potentially for the effectiveness of ferric citrate despite hepcidin induction may be that this formulation allows patients to tolerate higher doses of iron and that if enough iron is given, some will ultimately be absorbed despite hepcidin elevations. And indeed, uh, the dose of ferric citrate provided in this study contains 1,260 milligrams of elemental iron daily compared with um, 195 milligrams of elemental iron that's uh, provided in ferrous sulfate. Now, one of the secondary outcomes they looked at in this study was uh, FGF23, which also showed a trend uh, for being reduced uh, although this in the ferric citrate arm, although this did not quite reach statistical significance. What proportion of the FGF23 lowering is due to iron supplementation, which could be shared by other iron agents versus phosphate binding, which would be unique to this agent requires further study. Finally, um, what about IV iron? IV iron preparations have an overall similar structure with an iron core surrounded by a carbohydrate shell. And it is the properties of the shell, its size and stability with which it binds iron and minimizes the release of labile free iron that determines how large a dose of iron can be administered and how quickly. Characteristics of some of the common IV iron preparations are shown here. One different agent is ferric pyrophosphate citrate, which is a water soluble iron salt administered via dialysate generally or uh, can also be given IV. This donates iron directly to transferrin, which contrasts with the other iron agents, which are generally uh, taken up by macrophages, which uh, process and release the iron. Although there are limited head-to-head -head trials uh, comparing these IV iron agents, in general, the data suggests that they have similar efficacy as far as improving iron parameters and anemia with generally similar side effect profiles. One area uh, where there are differences that have been seen is in relation to FGF23. Uh, this is data from a prospective RCT in patients with iron deficiency anemia, randomized to ferromoxetol versus ferrocarboxymaltose. As you can see, the ferrocarboxymaltose induced FGF23, whereas ferromoxetol did not. This was despite the fact that they were similarly effective at improving iron. This suggests that this effect on FGF23 is not a property of the iron per se, uh, but the carbohydrate shell. And this is physiologically relevant because it did lead to uh, urinary phosphate wasting and hypophosphatemia, uh, as well as reduced vitamin D levels. This, is le uh, this study was not a CKD study, and this issue is less likely relevant in patients with advanced CKD where the phosphatoric effect would be more limited. 
Still, this should be kept in mind when choosing iron formulations and monitoring response to therapy in patients with earlier stage CKD or those at risk for hyperphosphatemia. So just to conclude, disorders of iron homeostasis are a major cause of anemia and CKD and associated with adverse outcomes. We now have good RCT data with hard outcomes demonstrating efficacy and safety of IV iron repletion in hemodialysis patients. The work group has, uh, 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 has uh, concluded that the, there is now sufficient new data um, from new trials, as well as novel therapies, which we'll hear more about in the second talk, that are available to warrant an update of the KDGO anemia guideline. This is now in process. However, there are many areas where more research is needed. For more details, please see our um, summary of our uh, controversies conference that was recently published in Kidney International. Thank you. So thank you, Jody, for this great presentation. We will now switch to the second presentation of the day by Dr. Francesco Locatelli. His presentation is entitled, What is the future of ESA therapy? Francesco, please. Thank you, Tillman, for your kind introduction, and thank you to KDGO for this invitation. The topic of my talk is uh, the future of anemia treatment in uh, chronic kidney disease patients. Here, my disclosure. The currently available erythropoietin-stimulating agents are the short-acting hypoalpha, beta, and theta, the long acting darbopoietin alpha and methoxypolyethylene glycolipoietin beta, and also we have the biosimilars. What do we share in common? They stimulate erythropoiesis by activating the hyporeceptor. However, they have very different pharmacokinetic profile, going from 20 hours as half life from a, a short acting hypo. Uh, beta, zeta, alpha, to the, the pegylate beta that is uh, 164 hours. So the larger the molecule, the longer the half-life, the lower the receptor affinity, the longer the administration frequency, the better the stability at room temperature, and the lower the influence on the root administration. Very few trials compare the different ESA. And this is a trial from Japan, from data from the registry. And approximately, they study 200,000 patients comparing the short acting versus the long acting. And the study outcome was two year all cause and cause specific mortality. The results of the trial were that in multivariate cost model, long acting ESA users had 13% higher rate of death compared with short acting ESA users. And also considering the long acting users, there was a 12% higher rate of cardiovascular death compared with the short acting ESA users. This trial is uh, very important from the statistical point of view and because the large population, there are also some limitations. For example, if you look at the conversion factor between short and long gutting, this conversion factor was rather low, one to 163 in the third trial, two, one, one to 136 in the third trial. And you know very well that in Europe, the conversion factor is a one to 12, to one to 200, and in the United States, even one to 300 and even more. So this is suggesting that possibly the inflamed patient will switch to the long gut diseases. Also because, uh, you know, in Japan, there is a limit in the amount of short acting dose that is possible to be administered. We did a randomized control trial comparing the pegylated beta with the other agents. And this uh, was uh, done in almost 3,000 patients. 
And we stratify the patient according to the treatment status and the C-reactive protein level. The primary endpoint was a composite endpoint of all cause mortality, non-fetal myocardial infarction strokes. And the pre-specified non-inferiority margin was one to 20 for the ISA ratio. Uh, we enroll 83% of patients on dialysis, 74 for Europe, and we are able to analyze uh, 1,409 patients in both groups. And the median follow-up was uh, 3.4 years with the maximum of 8.4 years. And here the primary endpoint analysis uh, you remember the, the primary endpoint was a composite endpoint of all cause mortality and no fetal myocardial infarction strokes. And there was no difference at all between the two groups. The number of events were absolutely the same in both groups. And here is also the component of the primary endpoint. The all cause mortality was absolutely the same. The same is true for the time to myocardial infarction as time to stroke. And also, considering the secondary endpoints, the same was the time to the first thromboembolic event or gastrointestinal bleeding. As far as this, the iron parameter, the ferritin level were the same between the two groups throughout the trial why the transfer is saturation was a little bit higher in the pigulate beta group. DOPS did a study comparing the long gutting versus short ATSA. And you can see here in the model three in the last column, including also ISA dose, the, there are no difference at all between the long gutting and the short gutting. Uh, the only numerically ever, eventually is favoring the long gutting. The same is true looking at the uh, US data and also in Europe, why in Japan as not expected, the number were favoring the short acting drugs. But of course we have to take into consideration that the sample was uh, collected from the same registry that we saw before. In Italy, uh, there is, uh, with, with this trial was published looking at the effect of short acting and long acting in non dialysis patient population. And uh, this uh, was analyzed according to the tertiary dose of the ISAS. And you can see that uh, uh, there is a clear association between the risk of end stage renal disease or mortality for the short acting drugs while it's not the case for the long-acting drugs. So the results are in non-dialysis, in this case are absolutely the opposite of the result in dialysis population in dialysis registry. And now we have moved to the new drugs, the, the so-called hypoxia inducible factors. They are transcriptional factors that respond to the change in available oxygen in the cellular environment. They have been defined as oxygen sensors. They are regulated by a family of proliferative hydroxylase enzymes, PHDR1, 2, and 3. And for underlying the relevance of the research, these gentlemen received the Nobel Prize for their research in this topic. The mechanism of the action of the drugs are very interesting because they are able to stimulate the endogenous production of erythropoietin, but in the same time, they are facilitating the absorption of the iron from the gut and the mobilization of the iron from the reticular endothelium. And these two mechanisms are of paramount importance for improving the, the, the level of the mobility in the CKD population. Of course, we are worried about the risk of very high APO levels. And this trial was uh, very effective in demonstrating that uh, usually the peak level of the APO are not 
very relevant using these drugs, but you should take into consideration there are some possibility to have very high level also using this drug. And this is uh, for unknown reasons. Another important point to be considered is the risk of increasing the vascular endothelium growth factors levels. And according to this experience, uh, Japanese experience is very clear that the, the level are not too high. So in some way, this is reassuring for the major factor possibly causing side effects. But of course, uh, uh, this uh, is something to be tested in the clinical trials. Are the results of the first trial available? Yes. We have uh, this uh, paper published two years ago at the New England Journal of Medicine comparing roxadustat with placebo in non-dialysis patient population. And the drugs was uh, absolutely superior in comparison to the placebo. So there are no, no doubt about the efficacy of the drug. But what about the side levels? And here you can see that uh, the upsiding was reduced in the Rosatustat group while it was stable in the placebo group. But this is not unexpected. But also in dialysis population, why the mobile level were more or less the same in the Rosatustat group and the EPO alpha group, the level of upsiding were much more reduced in the uh, EPO group but you take into in the in the Rosatustas group in comparison to the APO group, but should be considered that the mobile level were higher in the Rosatustas group, in some way jeopardizing the interpretation of the results. Very recently, as is this paper comparing Badustat versus Tarbopoiety in non-dialysis patients was published in the New England, New England Journal of Medicine analyzing the effect on hemoglobin in the incident to the treatment and the prevalent to the treatment. And in the both group, the, the, the non-inferiority was reached, demonstrating the efficacy of the drugs. However, as far as the, the safety, unfortunately, the, uh, the, the level, the, the hazard ratio was 1.17, but the confidence interval was higher, so the non-inferiority was not reached. And this was uh, considering the major adverse cardiovascular event or the extended major adverse cardiovascular event, uh, or even considering the mortality for uh, cardiovascular disease also for any causes. And these uh, uh, results were mainly related to the fact that uh, non uh, the population, non USA population, uh, have a very high hazard ratio and confidence interval in comparison to the US population. So, this could be a possible interpretation of the differences, but it's uh, important to better analyze the data. And also, another paper in the same issue that New England Journal of Medicine was published taking into consideration the effect of Vadustat, Vadustat in comparison to darbopoietic in dialysis patients. And again, considering the correction, uh, the anemia or the maintenance, there are no difference between the two groups. So the, the non-inferiority was rich. In this case, the non-inferiority was rich also considering the safety. You can see here, the safety was, uh, the non-inferiority was rich considering the major adverse cardiovascular event, the, major, the expanded major cardiovascular event, and the cardiovascular or death for any causes. What about inflammation? In this trial that we saw before, uh, there are analyzed the data according to the different level of CRP, in the Rostatustat group, the mobile level were the same in the higher and the lower CRP group. And also the dose of the drug was almost the same. Why the level of uh, hemoglobin was lower 
in, the, in, the, in alpha, a poet in alpha group, and the dose of hippo-alpha were higher in inflamed patient in comparison to the non-inflamed patient. This is another point of discussion. What about the iron administration? Of course, we have this data demonstrating that all the parameters uh, transferring total iron binding capacity, transferring saturation, ferritin, iron, all improve uh, in this trial in comparison to the placebo. But the same is true also analyzing in dialysis patients the roxadustat in comparison to uh, epoietin alpha. But again, this uh, is a matter of discussion. What about the relationship with the cholesterol? These drugs, in, in this case, with Davodustat, was able to reduce the total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, and HDL cholesterol. But the, the LDL cholesterol was reduced more than the HDL cholesterol, suggesting the possibility of uh, improving the cardiovascular risk at least in non-dialysis patients. What about the risk of exhaustion of apostimulation? But it's important to underline that erythropoietin synthesis in renal myofibroblast is restored by activation of hypoxia signaling as underlined by this study. What about the adverse events? We are aware of the risk related to the possibility of neoplasia, the possibility of uh, uh, retinopathy, including the diabetic retinopathy. Uh, that is a very important point. There is the risk of increase in the cysts and also the possibility of deteriorating the pulmonary hypertension. It's true that the risk of uh, hyperkalemia was not, not confirmed, but in the same time, there is a very important question mark related to the possibility of improving the iron metabolism and also in the efficacy in the inflamed patient. This is a, a very important uh, topic of debate nowadays. And also the fact that the Roxadustat was able to improve uh, the outcome in an incident, the dialysis patient was not confirmed by the primary analysis. But the question is, uh, will there still uh, be a role for the originator after the approval of hypoxia inducible factor stabilizers? And this is a very important question, Mark. Another important point is uh, if uh, all these drugs are absolutely the same, because we have some suggestion uh, in some way try to underline the different uh, mechanisms or the different dosage of the drugs. And also the fact that you have different results, this is, a, of course, a very important open question. And another important question is, uh, if you are approaching the end of a recombinant hippo era, there are too many questions altogether. And this is the reason why uh, we don't have the answer yet, and we are waiting for the KDGO controversy conference that will be held in Germany in December of this year. And uh, we do hope that uh, this controversy conference will be able to clarify all the aspects that are not yet very well clarified. Thank you very much for your attention. And now we are open in collecting questions for the audience. I, first of all, I would like to thank uh, very much Jody and Francisco for these uh, brilliant talks. And we will now have time for some questions, some minutes or uh, 10 minutes or so, question and answers. Uh, I have a first question to Jody, which is also a question which came from the floor, uh, dealing with iron supplementation in patients 
uh, with uh, normal hemoglobin levels or even high hemoglobin levels, such as uh, ADPKD patients who may have iron deficiency but normal or even high uh, RBC levels. Would you uh, envisage giving them iron uh, in order to improve uh, other factors than anemia? <laughs> or would you re with, uh, refrain from that? Thank you, Tillman, uh, and thank you for the audience for that terrific question. I think this is actually an important area where we don't have research in the, the kidney disease world to tell us uh, whether that's important or not. There is some interesting literature, uh, as I mentioned in the talk, coming from the heart failure world where treatment of iron deficiency, even with normal hemoglobin levels, improved outcomes uh, uh, related to heart failure. Um, so I think the, uh, and certainly uh, as, as mentioned in the talk, iron has other uh, functions besides just making uh, a hemoglobin for, for red cells. So I think uh, as, theoretically there may be benefits, but we don't yet know um, what those might be and we don't know what pa which patient populations might benefit most. And this is an area that we need further study. But of course there could be a danger of uh, increasing uh, red blood cells even more and to create polycythemia? Um, I think that's probably not likely to happen. I think in, even in hemochromatosis patients, so patients with genetic iron overload, um, they, do, uh, they can get a, a slightly elevated hemoglobin levels, but not in the range of what you see with polycythemia. Um, so I, yeah. I would, in that, I mean, in the, I don't think that we're talking about treating patients, you know, you're talking about treating patients with iron deficiency, not with, um, <laughs> normal iron levels. So I, d I don't think that that is a risk to worry about. But of course, there are potential side effects of iron that we have to keep in mind whenever we're talking about uh, uh, treating patient populations. And this is why we need uh, trial data uh, to examine this. Well, that's reassuring. Thank you. Now a question to Francesco. Uh, the uh, non-inferiority non endpoint uh, reached by Vada Dustat in the non-dialysis dependent patients is of course of some concern. Could you just tell us whether other uh, studies with other compounds, uh, I mean with other HIF stabilizers in non-dialysis uh, non dependent patients showed similar results or this is the only one? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, at present is the, the only one given the non-inferiority in non-dialysis population. And this is a remission of the piggy. You remember the, the problem yeah. related to the old drug uh, was uh, not in the market anymore. We have the same problem. Strangely enough, in non-dialysis patients, the non-inferiority was not rich. So it's strange because usually we have more events in non-dialysis population. So the power of telling the difference could be higher. So uh, I think that you should be very careful in analyzing the data and particularly considering the possibility that the statistical power for non-inferiority might be was not enough. Yeah, but on the other hand, of course, uh, one would uh, rather uh, think that uh, Vada Dustat should be more effective in uh, stimulating uh, real EPO production uh, in non-dialysis dependent patients than in those with hemodialysis uh, treatment, especially when I think of uh, anephric patients, patients without kidneys, where there is no EPO producing cell anymore uh, activatable in the kidney and probably everything comes from the liver. So wouldn't you think that this is a bit strange? No, but the, the, the problem is that the, the trial was uh, looking at the target. So for reaching the target, usually in non-dialysis patients, we need less dose of the drugs. And this is yeah. the reason why is uh, there is some inconsistency in interpreting the data because I was expecting the opposite, uh, having more problem in dialysis patients where we are using much higher dosage. So this is uh, the reason why this will be a very important topic to clarify during the KDO controversy conference in December. Thank you. We clearly need more uh, ex more studies in this field and with hard outcomes. Now a question again to Jody. Uh, you mentioned that IV iron compounds such as ferric, carboxy, maltose 
uh, increase FGF23 and create hypophosphatemia, at least in patients with normal kidney function. Now, uh, probably this doesn't play any role in hemodialysis patients, but how about late stage CKD, uh, four or five stage uh, CKD patients? Would you uh, consider that there's no reason not to give uh, these compounds which stimulate FGF23? So I think that in the advanced CKD patients, the risk of hypophosphatemia would be low because they're not going to excrete, you know, it's due to renal phosphate excretion as a consequence of the SGF23. So I don't think that those patients, you would worry about that. Um, I guess there is the theoretical question of whether inducing FGF23 further in those patients may have, aside from phosphate, may have other effects just given the association of elevated FGF23 levels with other adverse outcomes, um, you know, cardiovascular outcomes and mortality, although a causal effect is still not necessarily clear in, in patients. Um, so again, it's an area where we, we don't know, um, but I think it's something worth keeping in mind and something that needs further study. Okay, thank you. Now I see a question coming from the audience. It says nephrologists have in general in general, initiate treatment with iron just when hemoglobin levels reach 10 grams per deciliter or less. Do you think treatment should start earlier? And in the cases where patients have normal hemoglobin values, but iron below 200? Well, should should one start earlier uh, with uh, iron therapy? Again, a great question where we, we don't have the answer. I, I, and I think that we do need uh, more data to tell us that. Certainly in patients with heart failure um, and with iron deficiency, there, there's strong literature suggesting that there's improvement in, 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 in uh, some patient symptoms in heart failure class and potentially heart failure hospitalizations. Um, and, um, you know, I think that we don't have data, but I do think that, uh, in my opinion, it would probably be a beneficial thing to do. Yeah, thank you. Another question from the floor, uh, from the audience. Are there predictable char characteristics of phenotypes in the, your patients with CKD that may predispose them to be more hyper-responsive to ESAs? That's a question for Francesco. <laughs> this is very difficult question, but uh, for sure, considering that we, we have uh, apparently more efficacy with inflamed patients. So I'm expecting the, the possibility of using this drug, particularly for diabetic patients, where the inflammation is higher in the other CKD yeah. population. Uh, so in case of hyper-responsiveness to the present ESA, I think that should be possibly one of the most important fields to test the drug. And of course, the other major factor is, as we all know, uh, iron deficiency. So first, uh, correct iron deficiency, then try to uh, <laughs> correct inflammation if possible. And if that is not the case, either it's not successful, then we have to look for the many other factors, which may also play a role, which have been well outlined in many, many reviews. You would so, agree, I guess. So, yeah. Dr. Tillman, I think that, so first of all, you should be a doctor. Take care of the patient look at the complication of the patients and after that starting correcting iron and only after to try to start the ESA of if stabilizer what do you want yeah his stabilizers and iron uh, metabolism or iron uh, status i think both of you uh, addressed this issue somewhere uh, is it correct if we state today that we still do not have definitive evidence that uh, HIF stabilizers or PhD inhibitors uh, clearly decrease the need for oral or intravenous iron? Or would you say this is now, this issue has now been solved? It is for me. During yes. my presentation, I underlined that uh, there are not clear data. There are strong suggestions, but not clear proof. So I think you should wait for more confirmation. So this is also what is, has been recently published in our KDGO Controversies Conference uh, report in Kidney International. So nothing new here since that date was very recent indeed. 
the last question maybe to uh, again to um, Francesco. I recently found an article in uh, Journal of Bone Mineral Research uh, saying, stating that uh, hemodialysis patients receiving high EPO doses are at higher risk of bone fracture. Did you see this and do you have any explanation for this or is it just an association? No, I saw, I saw the paper, but usually you use uh, this uh, high dose of EPO when the patients are frail, inflamed, so it is uh, very likely to be an association related to the comorbidity of the patients. Yeah, it's a kind of uh, confounding by, uh, <laughs> uh, by other factors which are more important. I would agree with that, yeah. Uh, so I think we come to the end of the uh, uh, meeting, to the webinar, of the webinar. I would like to thank again the two speakers with, for the excellent contributions. contributions. I would like to thank the KDGO staff for uh, an excellent preparation of this webinar and for their help in uh, setting all this up. And uh, I think now we come to a close. Thank you all and bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.